Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's celebrate Jesus one more time. Amen. Can you walk up to two or three people and tell them good morning? Let them know that you are glad they are in the presence of God. Are you just looking around or you are walking to one or two people? Appreciate them sincerely. It's good to see you this morning. Tell them. I'm glad you are among the living. And I'm glad that we'll enjoy his presence together. Amen. Father, we love and we honor you. Thank you for this morning. The privilege that you have granted us to drink from the fountain of wisdom that only you can give. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you speak to our hearts. Help us to rise. Help us to ascend in the spirit. And in the name of Jesus that our lives will never remain the same after this encounter. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you again for this unique privilege. And... Um, We'll just get straight to the business of the morning. The Lord began to deal with us yesterday along the lines of understanding his prophetic end time program. Yesterday when um, I began, we considered a few things that it is important for us to know that God has a program for the nations. God has a program for this region and that we must understand his program and then be in alignment submit ourselves to partner with what the spirit of god is doing and then we did say that god's prophetic program for the nations affect three categories of people number one the world of unbelievers number two the church and number three society hallelujah and then we took the subject of the global harvest yesterday night for a case study we examined a few things from matthew chapter 9 being our text jesus wept uh well it was it was it was a bleeding from his heart he was moved with compassion and it was that the field was wide and yet the laborers were few and he said pray ye the lord of the harvest that he will send laborers and so i told us that every time there is a problem as far as the harvest is concerned the diagnosis based on scripture and in the mind of jesus is the inefficiency of the laborers and the lord challenged us yesterday to be aware in a greater measure of the need to see sinners and to see souls saved this morning in continuation i want to discuss now the second level of the program of god that has to do with the church hallelujah so we we dealt with the world of sinners and unbelievers but the second assignment is to the church and this morning through the lens of scripture the lord wants to show us the kind of vessel that can be used by god especially in this end time it is a costly assumption to believe that god will use everybody it's a costlier assumption to believe that god will use every available vessel the narrative until now is that once you are available you will be used by god that is not true even our world teaches us that it takes more than availability when students write jam or write whatever exam they are available to go to college but not everybody makes the quota the life of gideon and the story of gideon is a revelation that many can be called but in truth only few are chosen so we need to examine through the lens of scripture what kind of a believer is god looking for what kind of a man of god is god looking for what kind of a vessel 
is God looking for? If it is true that God has standards and his standards are unbending, his standards are uncompromising, then it is important for us to not just be aware that God wants to move across the nations and not just be aware that we can make ourselves available, but we need to know God's standards so that we obtain grace to rise to that level that can make us great and prepared vessels. When it has to do with the program of God, God is not ashamed to declare his need for man. As mighty and as great as God is, he has been very vocal and outspoken as to the fact that when it has to do with the advancement of his purposes on earth, he needs the cooperation and the partnership of man from the moment he made that divine declaration in genesis 1 26 down to 28 the bible says and elohim said let us make man in our own image and after our likeness he says and let them have dominion the moment that utterance came out from the lips of god it became scripturally incorrect for God to do anything on earth and leave man out of the program. Not because he does not have the sovereign power, the earth still remains the Lord. But from that statement, he has come into an eternal partnership with man. As far as his dealings on earth is concerned, there will always be a need for a man. It's important for us to appreciate this as an introduction this morning. Sometimes you see the Bible express God as though he were helpless. And you are tempted to ask, God, you are so mighty. What is it about man that makes you so... Can't you push him out of the way and do everything yourself? This was a contemplation of the psalmist. Hallelujah. That should be Psalm 8. The psalmist began to vocalize his contemplations and he says... When I consider the works of your hands, this and that and that, all that you have created, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Nor the son of man, he says, that thou visitest him. He says, you have made him a little lower than the angels. The word there is Elohim, a little lower than God. You have crowned him with glory and virtue. And Paul, quoting that scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, added a greater context to it. You have set him above the works of your hands. You have made him the zenith of your creation. And that in doing so, you left nothing that was not under his feet. He says, but we do not yet see all things under his feet. So let us have it as a very clear understanding that for as long as the program of God in this side of his kingdom is concerned, God will always need men. You would hear expressions in scripture, I sought for a man. As a case study, let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. The Bible begins the book of Isaiah with a very interesting rendition. Prophet Isaiah begins that book by giving several profound prophecies. But when we get to chapter 6 and verse 1, 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Verse 2. And it stood, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Verse 3. And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, when Isaiah saw this, he was watching this in a vision. He said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hands, 
which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this had touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged and also I heard a voice of the Lord saying verse 8 is my verse of emphasis whom shall I send and who will go for us whom shall I send and who will go for us? This is a divine call from God himself. Look at the kind of glory and splendor that was described from verse 1 down to verse 5. How can such a great God, look at the beauty of the seraphims themselves, covered with six wings, with two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet and with two they flew should such a god be in need of anybody isaiah said the whole earth is filled with his glory and that even his vision the smoke of his presence filled everywhere and instead of god making a declaration to say isaiah let it be known to you that i am god all by myself i can do anything i want to do I am Alpha Omega. You would think that is the kind of sound that should come from such splendor. And yet in the midst of that splendor, the sound that comes out is who shall go for us? Who shall I send? And who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Many believers wonder why in every generation it looks as if God just isolates a few people particularly as touching the fivefold ministry and then they receive such a mighty investment of his grace and power upon their lives doing great and mighty things for God throughout their generation while it looks like there is a crowd of others just crouching to find relevance as far as spiritual things are concerned this troubled me for many years as to why a God that is so benevolent and lavish would seem to be so meticulous about the use of men until I found out that it took more than availability to be used by God. So let's join you a bit to see a few of the factors that determine God's using a man. Because I can tell you in the Southeast, God is still looking for men in this nation God is still looking for men in the world today God is still looking for men we examined yesterday that Jesus himself said truly the harvest is wide but the laborers are few and he left us with a recommendation he said pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will recruit more laborers hallelujah and God's recruitment system is about the strictest I am aware of. In our world today, there are many corporations that sometimes they call to receive um, new employees, new staff structure. And sometimes you see the burdensome requirements that they put. You must have this number of years of experience. You must have this range of qualifications. And even at that, it does not guarantee by itself that you will get the job and you can find out for a job with a vacancy of 10 or 15 spaces you can find as much as 15,000 graduates apply am I right on that and people invent all kinds of skills some use their uncles who are working there other people go to church for prayer other people consult shrines and everybody invents his skill to ensure that he gets into that place and at the end of it, it looks like there are a few people who seem to secure that spot. And if you go and ask the HR department, they will tell you that they are a kind. They may all be graduates. They may be all certified, but there are certain people that the corporation is looking for. And the reason why those corporations have the standards that are desired is because they do not compromise on their standards. God loves everybody, but it's important for us to know that he is passionate about the fruition of his program. And that passion is what has driven his strictness 
in the kinds of vessels that he uses and that he will use there are three requirements that the Bible reveals as to the kind of man God uses the kind of vessel that God desires to use and I want you to please lend me your attention scripture starts by saying apostle Peter teaching us nevertheless the foundation of the Lord standard show it says having this seal that the Lord knoweth them that are his then he says and let every man that named the name of Christ depart from iniquity then he says but in a great house that there are four kinds of vessels in every great house number one vessels of gold number two vessels of silver number three vessels of wood number four vessels of clay and the Bible says already by that description some vessels are ordained unto honor and some vessels are unto dishonor but that you can transit this is the good news that should be first um, Peter I thought he was looking for it. okay second Timothy now two and let's do 20 and 21 second Timothy 2 21 that was Paul mentoring his son Timothy but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth and he says some vessels are unto honor and some dishonor now watch 21 carefully Apostle Paul is teaching us in this scripture that a possibility exists that you can evolve yourself from any level and any kind of vessel you are into the highest quality of vessels now scientifically clay cannot become silver clay cannot become gold wood cannot become gold but here is paul teaching us that in the spirit transiting in quality as a vessel is possible that I can start as a vessel of wood and a vessel of clay. Do you know the difference? The difference in the quality of these vessels are only revealed in the presence of fire. You never know how qualitative they are until you expose them to fire. When you expose wood to fire, it, it, it just completely burns off when you expose clay to fire it breaks but when you expose silver and gold it becomes malleable enough to be molded into any shape you desire but there is no disintegration are we together yeah. so he's saying that these four kinds of because of the fierceness of the assignment that the vessels will be involved in He's saying there are some vessels because they have chosen to remain in that state. Their destiny will be dishonored. Eventually, they will not last. Not because it is the will of God to keep them that way. The quality of the vessel they have assumed does not have longevity in view. Are we together? So he's now saying there is a condition upon which a man can evolve. To become a more superior vessel and the key is found in verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself from these he says he shall be a vessel unto honor that means becoming a vessel unto honor is not just the will of God per se it is totally the responsibility of the individual vessel he says he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and then prepared unto every good work may we be such vessels in the name of Jesus Christ I have studied great people who have been used by God in modern history and from scripture all in a bit to piece together the ingredients that truly makes a man usable 
by God. I wanted that first for my life and then to be able to extend that information to be a blessing to as many who sincerely desire to be used by God. I studied materials of men like T.L. Osborne, materials of men like Lester Sumrall, great prophets who had gone to be with the Lord, consulted materials of our fathers of faith. What exactly did God find in these men? that made them greatly used by God. And I came up with three keys, and this is what I want to share this morning. Number one, the first requirement, non-negotiable demand that God must find in an individual to be greatly used by him is called the purity of your heart. Please write it down, the purity of your heart. In order of priority, I have worked with God a bit, I tell you with all humility, and I can tell you that this I have learned about God. The greatest posture that a man can take to secure the attention of God over your life is the state of your heart. The state of your heart vetoes your prayer life. The state of your heart vetoes your fasting. The state of your heart vetoes your Bible study. There is no other Christian experience that is exalted higher than the state of your heart. Every other thing in your life as a Christian activity only finds its relevance with respect to the state of your heart. Please understand this. Our world today is full of very sincere spiritual activities from fastings to prayer to what study, to all kinds of spiritual activities. And many people find out that the more they engage in these activities, it looks like these activities carry a semblance of, it, 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 it captures within it the ability to bring them closer to God. But in practicing these things, they still find out that what they are looking for is truly not found. Because it is not found in activities, it's found in a state. There must be a posture that any believer who desires to be used by God, if you want to be used by God as a vessel, I tell you the truth, no matter what else you bring to the table, if it is outside of the purity of the state of your heart, God cannot do much with you. Do you know the reason why David earned a status in the Bible called a man? after god's heart i don't know how many times david had direct encounters with god but there are people in scripture who had greater encounters than david an example moses moses was called the meekest man but never called a man after god's heart look at the laborious assignments that was given to moses to take god's covenant people from egypt the land of captivity and to take them to Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. God called him the meekest man. And yet he never had that report that he was a man after God's heart. How about other prophets who had great encounters with God? Not even Samuel, the mighty prophet, was called a man after God's heart. If you want to know the life of David... And why God called him a man after his heart. You go and study the entire life of David. At the end of it, you will almost be confused as to why such a man, as to why such a man should be called, maybe you may need to put your phones on silent, please. A man after God's heart. How does he call a man like David a man after God's heart? Read your Bible and see some of the atrocities that David committed. Read your Bible and see some of the things that David went through. The reason for Uriah's death. The reason for many other things that happened. And yet, among the many things that God could accord this man was the status of a man after my heart. There are many names that God gives men. God is not careless in naming men certain things. He called Abraham my friend. You know what it means to be a friend of God? We are not discussing that. But do not downplay that status. 
if a man is called a friend of God it is a very serious commendation there are some things that will not happen to you again when you become a friend of God for instance you cannot be lost again it is a privilege for you to be lost God will take you even if it's an untimely death but you will not be lost again it is a status and an honor when a man is called a friend of God hmm. hallelujah the second thing that you earn as the friend of God is that there is nothing he does within his program that he will keep you outside of that information that's what happened to Abraham shall I hide this from Abraham he had to come and tell Abraham this is what I want to do to Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham says stop I have an interest there do not go yet there is somebody's interest that I need to protect and he literally negotiated the salvation of Lot and his family the friend of God so you now understand what he meant when he told the apostles he said I no longer call you servants but friends they didn't even know what he was saying that is the reason why even in heaven the foundation of the new Jerusalem has their name the names of the 12 apostles can you imagine that let's get back to what we're discussing the purity of your heart let me show you a scripture second chronicles 25 1 and 2 second chronicles 25 1 and 2 a very interesting story about a king called Amaziah we're going to read verse 1 and 2 together Are we ready one to read please Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Jehoiada of Jerusalem now read verse 2 as loud as you can one to read and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. One more time. What kind of a statement is this? How can you do what was right in the sight of the Lord? And then the Lord says, even though this was right, there is still a problem with it. The problem was not the correctness of the activity. The problem was the state of the heart that executed it. That a man can preach correctly and yet be found wanting in the spirit. A man can do evangelism correctly and still be found wanting in the spirit. You can build ministry correctly and still be found wanting. The Bible says, give us that scripture. <laughs> he did what was right in the sight of the lord but there was a, tr a problem he was not a fake man of god he was not a fake prophet he was not a fake apostle he was not a fake preacher genuine you would come and see him preach and you would be so convicted by his message and yet in marking his script the lord gives us the marking standard that beyond the correctness of a man's activity the first thing that is marked in the spirit is the state of your heart never forget this scripture for the rest of your life you can fast right you can pray right you can give right you can preach right you can do business right and be surprised that in spite of the correctness of your activity heaven still finds you wanting Amaziah he served he did what was right in the sight of the Lord but not with a perfect heart hmm. The purity of a man's heart is the principal determinant of your doing business with God, of your being used by God, mightily used by God. Beyond your activities, 
God looks at the state of your heart every man you see that God has used and is using greatly I can tell you whether you believe it or not there is something God has found about the sincerity of their heart no wonder in choosing vessels by the time you see God's selection you will be angry because when God is done choosing the kinds of people they do not match what you would have wanted it does not make sense are we together now do you know the reason why Jonah ran away from the instruction God gave him there was something about God Jonah knew that out of these depraved people who were idol worshippers who were insincere people that if you went and he preached to them that as bad as they were their hearts were still pure because their activity was a product of their orientation and they had not been given a chance yet to declare whether they loved God or not and so God seemed to have an interest in a terrible nation called Nineveh and Jonah knew this that God will look beyond the wrongness of their activity that in spite of the fact that that land was in decadence the purity of their heart was crying for help and he said Jonah go to them and Jonah said I know something about God by the time I now preach these people will repent and he will forgive them as if he did not see anything they did and Jonah ran away immediately Jonah ran away he became an enemy of God there's no time I would have taught you what it means to be an enemy of God to be an enemy of God does not mean to be satanic the moment you become an a consistent interruption to his program even if he's the one who ordained you you become an enemy of God so when you are praying the prayer let God arise and all his enemies verify first that you are not one of them did you hear what I said Jonah was not a fake prophet but because he became an interruption to God's program in Nineveh look at how merciless his judgment came people received prophet Jonah into their boat and started going down they lost their businesses they lost their relevance they were about to lose their lives how can a mighty prophet be the reason for the downfall of many if you know God, you will know that it's not about being fake or real. It's about being in his program or outside of his program. <laughs> so in the moment you say, I am a genuine man of God, to mean because I am a genuine man of God, God's program must be advanced through my life. You are in error. There are many genuine people who are interruptions to God's program. Are you learning now? Yes. How can Jonah, a, the Bible never charged Jonah with falsehood. The Bible never charged Jonah with idolatry. And yet, because he refused to go and preach to Nineveh, a land that he was justifiably angry. These were a people rating by their activities. They were wicked people, yet their hearts were pure. You now see why Jesus taught in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in there is a reward for them he says they shall see God that the purity in heart is a requirement for encounters my God that means someone can be smoking and can be drinking and God is looking beyond that wickedness and he's looking at the state of his heart and the language of his heart is saying I need a savior and Jesus Christ will come and appear to that gentleman under a bridge and say I have come to visit you and you are wondering why another person is fasting three days dry and may never have an encounter the, I hope you know that the heart of men has a voice say not in your heart a man's heart can have a voice beyond the activities of men God listens to the heart of man I can pretend here and be doing a lot of religiosity and saying oh apostle joshua selman this is a humble man of god and then heaven is watching while all that religious drama is happening just to make a name heaven and is hearing the voice of pride the voice of unseriousness are we learning now no wonder in selecting the one who would be the king david I hope you know David's being a man after God's heart 
did not just happen when he was king it was why he was called in the first place that gentleman was in the wilderness where nobody saw him nobody could clap for him and yet he defended his father's sheep even at the expense of his life with nobody to see and he did not come back and tell his father this is what happened when it was time to anoint even the great samuel with his height of discernment was about to make a mistake and god said hold on this is not how i judge if you were to judge Eliab and all his brothers you would see them as people of stature and intelligence are we together now and yet that was not how god judged them so a correct prophet with the ability to hear god says no to god's program and becomes god's enemy immediately he goes to board a ship going at the other side and because of that all the passengers in his ship started losing things there was a storm now do you know that the anointing was not designed to fight god the anointing only fights what is antichrist that means if god is the factor and the resistance behind your life no amount of prayer except the prayer of mercy will save you there are many people trying to use the anointing to stop things that is the very resistance of God that is bringing it. You see our ignorance? We think the anointing is just a multi-purpose instrument that fights anything, even God. No. The anointing has a protocol for its function. It must verify that what is the cause of that problem is antichrist. Then it can fight it and bring it to order. Because the assignment of the anointing is to bring all things into the will of God. That is a singular assignment of the anointing before the anointing works it verifies the will of God with respect to that situation so if an individual is sick the anointing diagnoses that state with respect to the will of God and knows that this is not the will of God now it can flow freely because its assignment now becomes to bring confirmation to the world outside of the will of God the anointing has no assignment except to confirm and to bring compliancy to the will of God. Are we learning this morning? So we're examining the factors that will cause a vessel to be used by God. And number one, we're saying the purity of your heart. And we consider the scripture. Let's look at it one more time. I don't want you to forget that scripture. Not Jonah, my dear media man. Second Chronicles 25 and verse 2. Let's read it again. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. He preached correctly. From a doctrinal standpoint, there was no error in what he said. Yet it did not produce the effect you thought would produce. You wrote the book correctly, theologically accurate, yet the impact that should come from it did not come you sang correctly when you came on stage nothing wrong with the revelation of your song but while you were singing people were just watching you as if you were reciting a poem to yourself the power that should accompany the correctness of that activity did not follow it there's something wrong with the heart when everything is right and the result still does not come the problem is not the activity the problem is the heart let me repeat myself when everything is right your tithing is right your giving is right your everything is right and yet the result that should follow does not follow forget about the activity and go back to re-examine the state of your heart when your preaching is right theologically constructed right with power and passion yet the transformation that should follow your teaching does not follow leave the issue of the sermon and go back to examine the state of your heart many people would have experienced deliverance faster if they understood that most of the things we think are the problems in our lives and our ministries are truly not the problem it's not the problem of the elders even though it looks like eldership is the problem in the church it's not the problem of money even though it looks like money is the real problem 
It's not the problem of witches and wizards coming to your church to masquerade as choir members or masquerade as protocol members. That, that is not the issue. In the, you notice that in diagnosing problems, we diagnose every other thing but the heart. Why is this church not growing, for instance? I think it's because we're at a, a wrong location. No, I think it's because maybe my sermons are not correct. Maybe they are too short. Maybe they are too long. Maybe to, to alter. And we invent all kinds of skills that touch every other activity. But the real problem, the state of the heart. The state of the heart. I have had people come to meet me and say, Apostle, I'm tired of this thing. I don't know what God wants again. I fasted till I'm almost feeling sick. No power, no revelation. In the midst of the fasting and prayer, I still had the dream I was trying to avoid again. Those spirits came as if they are not aware that I'm praying. In a prayer program, after three hours of praying, I just wanted to take a short nap and at just that five minutes, I was still in my village again. What kind of, what kind of, 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 of discouragement is this? The problem is not the activity. Correcting the activity without correcting your heart will only recycle your frustration. Let me say it again. Correcting the activity without correcting your heart. And I hope you know that the Lord has a lot of things to say about the heart of man. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Please give it to us. Let's see God's own diagnosis about and concerning the heart of man. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. That means the heart is so deceitful it can deceive even its owner. You who is the owner of the heart can be deceived by your own heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. He said, and desperately wicked who can know it. Verse 10. Watch how God rewards. Let's read. One to read, please. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. That means in rewarding men, in opening doors, in allocating graces, I look beyond just the zeal. There is something about the heart of man that I search for. The first requirement to be a vessel unto honor, to transit from a vessel of wood and clay to a vessel of silver and gold, to be like that man that the Lord is seeking for, to change nations, to change the climate of Enugu, the southeast, to be lifted as a vessel right from this place to the ends of the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, let's forget about the issue of church for one minute. Let's forget about the issue of apostle and prophet for one minute. Let's forget about the issue of intelligent ministrations for one minute. And let's allow the Lord, that great physician, to perform a surgery in our hearts. One of the worst medical cases an individual can have is cardiac arrest or anything that has to do with your heart. Are we together? Medical science will tell us that the major reason why people lose their lives is that eventually their hearts fail. There are organs that fail in your body and you can still, the ball can still be running, but not when your heart fails. Leave every other thing in your body right, but let your heart fail and you will die in an instant. With a correct brain, you will still die. With feet that is healthy, you will still die. With a body that you have labored, taking it to the gym, you will still die. But there are people whose feet have been amputated and yet they are alive. There are people who have lost fingers. There are people who have lost their sense of smell, lost their sense of hearing, lost their sense of sight. There are even cases of people who have dementia. There are people who have had brain damage. And regardless what happens to them, the deterioration, provided their hearts are still pumping, there is still hope for them. When you borrow that, that means your church building can still be working properly. The chairs can still be working well. The television station still working well. 
you're speaking as a man of god still well intelligence still there but the moment your heart is wrong there is a spiritual cardiac arrest and you will not understand the reason why in spite of partners in spite of branches in spite of everything there is no motion there is no progress i am telling you that the number one key in being used by god is your heart condition